All right. <laughs> Welcome, fellas. It's good to see you guys here. A lot of you are looking at me wondering what just happened. What day is this? It's not Tuesday, it's Monday. You're in the right spot. Uh, my father informed me that I'm going to be teaching this class and he's going to be teaching Tuesday for a while. And when dad tells you to do something, you have to obey. So Amen. Just, just let you know, that's what's happening. So I think he wanted to switch it up. And uh, I think he liked the group that I teach better than you all. So <laughs> that's my guess. I could be completely wrong. I'm coming so, <laughs> he'll, be, he'll be in Thessalonians tomorrow. And we're going to start off in the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah today. So that's the uh, plan. I hope it goes well. I. Uh, I want to start off with an icebreaker, but before I do that, uh, Chin, if you could open us with prayer, please. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and all your people and all these stories in here and uh, all historical events that took place in here. Help us glean from Jeremiah and understand you more, understand more things about you through this book. Uh, help Seth in his pursuit of delivery. And um, thank you for everyone here tonight. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you much. All right. I, I guess um, I haven't been in this group to teach in a while, so I always have to lay down ground rules when there's a new class, there's a new group or whatever. So uh, if anyone wants to take this for, I'll call it credit, if you want to get tests or quizzes, just come to me afterwards and we can talk about that. Um, how many of you have had a class in Jeremiah before? Just a, okay, okay, good, good. So I'll be relying on you to fill in any gaps that are up here for me. That's wonderful. Um, the only rule I have, honestly, is whenever there's a camera rolling, uh, you guys just make me look good. That's really all I ask. Uh, if you want to humiliate me, I'm perfectly okay with that. Just wait till the camera gets shut off. As soon as the camera's off, you put me in my place, that's fine. But you know, when the camera's on, it's just hard to live that down, so. Anyway, I appreciate it. And I will give you a hard time if you don't make me look good up here. That's, you know, I will. Um, all right, here's the question I wanted to ask. And there's so many of you, I'm not gonna make you know, everyone answer, but if anyone wants to, I know this is a guy's group, so. What is something that made you cry? What is something that made you cry? This is just by way of icebreaker. If anyone is not afraid to just speak out and say, here's Your something. Your stepfather's that... belt. Your stepfather's belt. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you yeah. don't this little bigger. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> My dad didn't really use the belt. He used the hand. But... Yeah. My daughter getting married. Yeah. Before that, dropping my daughter off to college. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> the the okay. older I get, the easier it is to cry. Oh boy. Yeah. 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 Just look forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm noticing that too. It bothers me a bit. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Something? Yeah. My daughter's announcement that she's pregnant. Oh. Okay. Interesting. A lot of dads in here and a lot of daughter references. I can, I'm not alone. That's good to know. Cool. Yeah. Loss of a loved pet, a beloved pet for uh, many years. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So, loss, gain, uh, family announcements, things like that. Anyone else have anything to share? Don't leave you out. Something that made you cry? I'm late. What happened? I'm asking the question, what's something that made you cry? Simple. Oh, Nothing. So. Nothing. Good for you. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you still got your man Not yet. <laughs> uh, I see the room looking like that. Okay. Good deal. Good deal. Yeah, for me, I, I know I went through a pretty long period of time where I just didn't cry. I just didn't feel the need. I don't know what it was. My wife thought I had a problem. I, I probably did. I felt like I had a problem. I thought, this is strange. But it was somewhere after having kids and somewhere in that process that that just kind of went away. Uh, if 
feel like maybe that's one of the reasons why God lets you have kids, so that you can just clear out these emotions and sinuses and everything all at the same time. So one of the reasons why I wanted to ask about that, thanks for sharing, but one of the reasons why I wanted to ask about that is because of the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 1. If somebody could flip over to that and just read that verse for me, just out loud, that'd be wonderful. What does Jeremiah chapter 9, the first verse, say? So that my head were a spring of water, and my eyes a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. Jeremiah is saying, oh, that my head were, what does he call it? What? A fountain? A spring of water. A spring of water. A fountain of tears gushing out. This is probably the main verse where people give Jeremiah a nickname. What's that nickname that often the prophet Jeremiah gets? The weeping prophet. And we can see in chapter 9, verse 1, it, it really fits. Um, what would some of the reasons be that you guys know, what would some of the reasons be why he would be considered the weeping prophet? Because he felt like no matter what he did, the people wouldn't listen to him, and he wasn't getting the job done. Yes, yeah, absolutely. He was doing his best, but just because you speak what's true and just because you have God's authority on your side doesn't mean that people are going to respond. Which, by the way, that to me is another argument for free will in Scripture. You know, the prophet of God is speaking, but the people oftentimes will just choose to reject that prophet. And as we see with Jeremiah, he, he has a lot of people not listening to him. Now, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I know just from uh, the small scope of my parenting as a dad, when somebody doesn't listen to me, a younger person doesn't listen, yeah, I don't know how you feel, but it's kind of, it's inside. The rage builds up, and I just think, you know, uh, you know, when people don't listen, I have a hard time with it. Sometimes I wonder, how does God, how is he as patient as he is sometimes? To let people just go on and on and on when he keeps warning them, but they keep doing their own thing. So Jeremiah has to feel the brunt of that. God handpicks this prophet to speak to the people, and he's going to speak to them for a very long time. And the first part of his ministry is basically warning people to straighten up their lives, you know, their life. But then later on, it's more of a too late guys. <laughs> it's it's over. You you're you're gonna be punished now because you didn't straighten up your life. So as Jeremiah goes, he would be the longest of the major prophets. Uh, Isaiah has more chapters than he does, but Jeremiah's got more words than Isaiah does. And Jeremiah has more than his book, right? What's the other book that Jeremiah wrote? Lamentations. Lamentations. There's further evidence that this guy could be called the weeping prophet. He's writing a book of Lamentations, yeah. Jeremiah wrote a lot, and so we're probably going to gloss over a lot of things in this class, unfortunately, but we'll do the best we can with the time that we have. But there's just so much of this prophet said. And um, he lived about 100 years or so, about 100 years or so after the prophet Isaiah. So we're going a little bit forward in time. And if you recall, during Isaiah's time, he was dealing with uh, the reign of the king Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. And during that time, the Assyrian forces were the big powerhouse. And they were the ones coming down. They had conquered the north, and they were coming down to threaten the south. Well, God spared the south at that time. But people got this false notion in their head, thinking, oh, well, if God spared us then, he's always going to spare us. They kind of developed this thing. Uh, I've heard my dad refer to it before as the 701 theology, the idea that, because uh, in 701, uh, the Assyrian king Sennacherib tried to take over Jerusalem, and God sent... How many angels? One angel to take out the entire forces, and the, the army was gone. And at that point, people thought, hey, God's always going to protect us. God's going to take care of us. we got nothing to worry about. And so they kind of developed this false sense of pride, thinking we're God's special people. And those of us in Judah, in the city of Jerusalem, God's special city, are going to be protected, and they kind of got this bad attitude. So you can call that the 701 theology, because they thought everything was okay. It wasn't okay. If you reject God, if you disobey what he says, 
there are going to be consequences for that. You cannot keep on going. By the way, what was one of the reasons why God uh, spared, if any of you remember in Isaiah's time, what was one of the reasons why God spared uh, the city of Jerusalem? Was there any good person that people praying? <laughs> yes, there were some godly people praying. Remember good King Hezekiah? That the, the king that took the letter from the uh, Syrian king, Sennacherib, and he stretched it out before God and he prayed and said, God, this is true. He could destroy us by his own might. <clears throat> we need you. You know, and God stepped in and because of the prayers of some of his faithful people delivered that city. <clears throat> and yet a lot of people, I'm afraid, got a mistaken <clears throat> idea that somehow they earned it or they have some special right to safety. And so their actions just got worse. And unfortunately, that's uh, not going to save the people. So a hundred years later, later, we got Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah is here and he's having to talk to the same people and say, straighten up, straighten up. But why was his ministry difficult? Well, probably various reasons. I just want to suggest one of them might be that the people had this false sense of security in their mind. This idea that God is never going to let Jerusalem fall because we saw what he did to the army of Assyria way back then. You know, my daddy told me all about it. It was amazing, you know, and it was. But unfortunately, just because God has delivered you in the past and helped you out doesn't mean that he doesn't require faithfulness all throughout. So he's having to fight against that. One of the things that really impresses me, because Jeremiah is going to go right on in through the Babylonian captivity, a very long ministry, but he starts probably when he's a teenager. That is a very young time to start as a prophet. By the way, there was a, uh, a professor um, that made this statement, and I, I just thought it was such a wise thing, and I've really taken it to heart. He, he would tell his students that you need to read hours and hours a day. You need to study hours a day. I think he recommended at least six hours of reading a day until you hit about age 30 or age 35. What was his rationale for that? He said, until you hit age 30, well, I don't remember if it was 30 or 35, you might remember, until you hit that age, nobody's going to listen to you anyway. <laughs> Nobody cares what you have to think. So I, my advice, his advice to us or to people was read and study so that by the time you are 30 years old, you actually have something worth saying. I thought, hey, you know what? That guy's, that guy's got some wisdom there. And I think, you know what? That's proven true time and time again. And uh, Hey, we're men here. I, I, I can complain to you guys, and you guys will take it you know, with a grain of salt, right? You won't wrap me out. My dad's right over there, whatever. But I'll tell you what. This happens all the time since he's here, okay? And I know this has happened to you. I know you can relate. You will suggest a piece of advice that you believe to be good, sound, scriptural advice. And you will give it to someone, and they will respond, kind of look at you, hmm. And then they'll go around, and they'll be asking other people for advice. And you know how that makes you feel. You're like, okay, apparently that wasn't good enough. Well, I did what I could. But what really gets me time and time again is when they go over and they ask somebody else, maybe somebody like that, <laughs> and that person gives them the exact same advice that I just gave. And what do they say? Wow, that is amazing. Thank you so much. You have really, really helped me. Have you ever had that happen to you before? Have you seen that happen? Time and time again, you're thinking, what? D d did I stutter? Did I say this wrong? You know, what is the deal here? I don't know. I chalk it up to something with age earns you a little bit of credibility. God wishes you humble. Yes. <laughs> this is true. That's why I'm only saying this to you guys. But I'm sure you've experienced this before too. All that to say, Jeremiah is a teenager. And God says, you're the one. You go tell these people. How do you think he feels? I don't know, but I bet you there's a little bit of this isolation that you're going to be experiencing. Someone this young... Can you expect people to even want to listen to you? Mm, yeah. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. Even if they know that he's a prophet, the respect that comes with age, it's just hard. It takes time to, to earn, and I'm sure he's going to feel pretty isolated throughout his ministry. So for these reasons and more, we could say, you know, the weeping prophet is a, is a, a title that probably fits the guy pretty well. So he's likely a teenager when he was called. Jewish tradition says that he wrote the books of First and Second Kings. So that's what tradition says. Um, 627 BC, or as the book says, in the 13th year of the reign of King Josiah is when he's going to start. 
and then he will continue his ministry down to 586 BC. So we've got just a hair over maybe 50 years of ministry. Just about a half century, just a little over a half century of Jeremiah preaching to these people. Whew. Talk about dedication, talk about commitment, and talk about repetitive, probably. Having to say the same thing over and over and over again to people, it's, it, it's a hard thing. But that's what he did. So probably, uh, if you want to round it off, you could say 50 years of ministry. Doc Smith uh, says it was 52 years. So um, this, I don't think it'll automatically play or whatever, and I don't have sound on. I wanted to point this out. No, no, it won't do it. I don't have it up. There's a, um, oh, it did come up. How about that? Sorry, I'm experimenting with technology now to see if it actually plays. Because I wondered if it would. I was talking to Jesse about this just a little while ago, and it sounds like the uh, sound is off. There's a website. This is a, a website called The Bible Project. Have any of you heard of The Bible Project before? Okay, good. Some of you have. I wanted you to be aware. I, I have not investigated all of it, um, all the videos on it. The ones that I have seen, I've gone through the first five books, they have some really neat kind of quick overviews of books of the Bible. And I really like that. Jesse apparently has watched more of them, so you can get with him afterwards and talk to him about that. But I just wanted to suggest that this video is about seven minutes long, and it overviews the entire book of Jeremiah. And it's very artistic and stuff like that. And the stuff I've seen so far has been pretty good. So um, I recommend it. I just thought it was worth passing on as something that might be helpful when you're overviewing. One of the difficulties I have in doing a study like the book of Jeremiah or, or a larger book is keeping everything organized in my brain which, if you guys know me, you realize things in there aren't that organized anyway. They're leaking all over the place, right? So when you're dealing with a book this large, trying to remember, okay, who was living at this time? Who was living at that time? Uh, when was he speaking? And maybe you observe this. God doesn't put the Bible in chronological order for us. I know it's hard to accept, but we Americans are not the only people that got God's revelation. So sometimes he chose to organize things differently. I, I'm pretty sure if the Bible was only given to an American society that we would have it nice and chronological from start to finish because that seems to be the way we think. However, there are other cultures and other times where they apparently didn't seem to think the way we think. What a shock. So. Uh, you're going to find a lot of the prophets, and Jeremiah is not an exception, are not in chronological order. They are organized kind of in sections, but some will go before and some will go after others. So um, having an overview, I find it's pretty helpful uh, when you get to know these prophets. Okay, so in order to set up the stage for Jeremiah, by the way, if I, if I forget to say this later, there are seven Jeremiahs in the Bible seven of them. So that to me right there, I was telling you how I get confused. Well, the fact that there is more than one Jeremiah can also be confusing. The one we're talking about here is, is a priest. We'll mention that in, in a bit. So before we get to the last five kings of Judah, we got to start back with here. King Manasseh, good or bad king? Bad. Bad. How bad? Bad, bad. Bad, bad. Yeah. Bad, bad. That's the Hebrew for really bad, right? Yeah, he's bad, bad. That, that is right. He is the worst of the worst as far as kings go. Kings of Judah. He is, in my opinion, the most negative thing you could say about his father, King Hezekiah, was to allow a son like this to be born. Something must have, some disconnect was there. Because Manasseh was the worst king there was. What else is unique about Manasseh? He reigned the longest of any of the kings of Israel or Judah. So much for uh, prosperous theology, right? So much for, you know, God blesses you and you have a long reign. No, he was the worst, and yet he reigned 55 years. He was the longest reigning king of the bunch, and he was bad. How bad was he? He, he sacrificed his own children to foreign idols. That was one of the many things he did. He, he attacked Israel or Judah 
in a spiritual sense with a vengeance. He dragged them down to idolatry about as fast as he could. He took um, pagan idols and he brought them into God's temple and set them up there. That was what this king was okay with doing. So spiritually, the people just were sinking down, down, downhill really fast. And which is easier, to bring people up or to bring people down? Always easier to bring them down. Well, the longest reigning king spent all his time bringing them down, except maybe the last six months, which talk about a heartbreaking scenario. The last six months of his reign, Manasseh wakes up and has, I guess, a conversion experience, realize he's been messing up, but he's got very little time after that. So he spends the last remaining months of his life trying to undo some of the damage that he did, and there's no way he could do it. <laughs> what, a, what a tragedy that king was. So Manasseh has spiritually brought the people of Judah downhill in a big way. And then after him, Ammon is a king that reigned for a really short amount of time. And then King Josiah takes, takes over at a really young age. Josiah, good king or bad king? Good. Good. Yeah, good king Josiah. He was prophesied way in advance, too, way back in the days of Jeroboam, which is he called him out by name, which is really something. Josiah was a good king. And so being a good king, he tried to bring about uh, good reforms. And you got to admit, this guy did some really, really good stuff. Uh, Jeremiah is probably a little bit younger, but right close in line with King Josiah, as far as how old he was, is my understanding. So those two are going to be similar in their ages and right around the same time. So Josiah is trying to drag the people out of this terrible uh, moral decay that Judah's been in. And so he's getting rid of these high places, um, these pagan altars, which by the way, do you know what the Hebrew word for high place is? It's Bama. I just oh. find that interesting. I don't know what I mean. If you put O in front of it, I don't know what that means. But anyway, I just thought that was interesting. And it really surprised me when I heard the Greek word Allah. It means but, but uh, that's what Allah means. But it's B-U-T, it's not, so. Anyway, neither here nor there. The uh, King Josiah was doing his best to reform the people. And one of the things that impressed me, I didn't even think about this, he even traveled to places that were not owned by him, that weren't technically in his Judean <laughs> territory, and he would travel out of there and he would destroy their pagan altars too. So he really attacked this thing with a vengeance and, and did some amazing things. But we can pretty well know that even him doing the best that he could do was... I'm not, I don't want to say it's a fleeting effort, but I do want to suggest that maybe it was, uh, it was not nearly as much as needed to be done. That's what I'm going to uh, suggest. Why is that? Because during Josiah's reign, the high priest Hilkiah was doing a little cleaning in the temple. A little spring cleaning, right? Or maybe it was winter cleaning. I don't know what season it was, but he was cleaning out the temple. And you remember what he found? The law. Book. He found the book of the law. What's the book of the law? <laughs> now, I, people debate, you know, was it just the book of Deuteronomy or was it the first five books or whatever? The point is, though, if it's the book of the law, the law is what they're supposed to be enforcing. That's what they're supposed to be following. That's what God gave to them through his prophet Moses. And they just found it. So Josiah's been reigning, trying to trying to bring the people to a spiritual transformation without God's law. Now, I don't know about you guys, but how well do you think you would honor God if you didn't have the Bible? I mean, I, you might try your best, but can you really please God as much as you should if you didn't have any revelation about what he wants versus what he doesn't want? That'd be pretty tough, I think. And, you know, I think a similar example might be if we were to have a, a really great announcement. If you were to hear about a church up the road, and I guess I shouldn't pick on any of the churches over here because it's too fun and easy to do. But we'll just say a church a few counties over. You hear about that church and you really don't know anything about them at all, okay? You just don't know much. But then you find out from a member that goes there that, that said, hey, we had an amazing Sunday this Sunday. 
It was so great. I, we all grew so much closer to God. I know we matured a lot. And you say, well, why is that? Because somebody introduced us to something we'd never seen before. You said, really? What's that? It's called a Bible. <laughs> what? Yeah, it's a Bible. Did you know that existed? Yeah. <laughs> what, all right, what are you thinking about this church at that moment? You're probably thinking a lot of things, but most of those things you're thinking are not very spiritual things. You're probably thinking, what have you guys been doing with all your time? You know, clearly that tells us the level has gone down pretty far. and You've got a long ways to go. Well, Josiah is trying his best. Hats off to the guy, right? But he finds the book of the law. Long way to go. Clearly a long way to go. And by the way, how did it get lost? How, you know... Some of you probably know better than me, but I'm thinking, I thought the temple was supposed to be a place that was kept somewhat clean, somewhat orderly. I thought there was a system to where things went. But apparently, after the idols got brought in there, it got cluttered up enough that the book of the law could be lost for years and not be found. <laughs> Sounds like it wasn't being used the way it should be, you know? It, it, it really doesn't. So that gives us a hint. This is the spiritual condition of the, the people of Judah. This is the condition of Jeremiah's audience. These are the people that he's got to talk to, and he's got to make progress with them. But what does he have to deal with? Well, probably a lot of preconceived knowledge, stuff that they think they know that they really don't, i.e. that God's never going to really betray us because he saved us in 701, you know. So God's never going to let us down. And then, oh, we're, we're doing what God wants. We're very spiritual people. You know, there, there are altars everywhere. And we, you know, are very spiritual. And then Josiah is trying to bring about reform, but he's just now getting the law back into their hands. So you can see, long way to go. And so we've got the other kings mentioned here. Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Zedekiah. Jehoiakim, which to me, these are very confusing. Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim. They're almost sound the same. Really, really short reign. Zedekiah is going to be the last one. When we get to King Zedekiah, we are getting to the end of the kings. When we get to the end of the kings, we're talking about the end of uh, Judah's freedom as well. They're going to be dragged into captivity. And who's going to take them into captivity? The Babylonians are. People of Babylon. And Jeremiah is going to be alive clear till that happens for 50 years preaching the same message to these people and that's what he's got to do uh, in case you haven't noticed and I think you have I'm really trying to belabor that point why because God might allow you to be in an environment where people just aren't listening to what he says where people just don't seem to really care to submit their life to the authority of Christ and what he says in his word. So, what do you do? And you say, oh well, I've had enough. I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> or do you keep going, even if you're not getting results? Um, I think Jeremiah is a good lesson for us in that regard. He had to keep on going. He had to be consistent and to never give up because he knew what was right, even though he didn't get the results that he probably wanted to. He got tiny little spots of you know things here and there. He got some respect, <laughs> but he didn't get a big uh, you know overwhelming response of people listening to him. As a matter of fact, we're going to come to a section where Jeremiah is dragged off against his will. They're like, "You're coming with us," and he didn't even want to go. He's been telling the people not to, but uh, you know. They didn't respect him a lot, many times. And maybe that'll be the case for you. Maybe that'll be the case for me. We're trying to speak out. We're trying to do what's right, but people don't care. And it's very easy, I think, to start counting numbers at, at some point and thinking, man, I'm, I must not be effective because I don't have a great following of people. And I just have to remind myself, is that how God counts things? Does God count heads like yes I baptized you and then we're done with you you know there's a lot more to this thing of maturity discipleship growth uh, a lot more to it and sometimes we don't get the luxury of seeing the uh, results of our labor 
which I have a lot of respect for people, by the way, who can keep laboring without even seeing the good that they're doing, and then other people uh, find out about it. I know I'm one, and I'm sure you guys too, that in particular, I'm, I'm really blessed by a lot of what other people have done, and I think most of these people don't even know they did it. You know what I mean? Whether it be the Bible study tools that somebody created, or the people that somebody talked to, um, in ministry, I sometimes I feel kind of bad. There, there used to be this understanding that an evangelist or a preacher or whoever, uh, he's the one that's going to baptize whoever it is. You know, he's going to offer an invitation. They're going to come forward, and he's going to baptize them. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm mean, more than happy to do that. But where did that expectation come from? Why is it that it's just assumed that oh, you're going to be the guy that does it? A lot of times, I feel like preachers, in particular, we reap the benefit of a lot of other people's work. You know what I mean? A lot of friends have been pouring into friends, trying to bring them closer to a relationship with God, and then along come, come us, they bring them to church or whatever, and we get the privilege of being able to dunk them, and that's great. I'm glad, but I love it when a friend gets to baptize their friend, too, because, uh, Sometimes I'm afraid we, we get taught or we believe a, a notion that's not true, that, well, I'm only qualified to take them so far, and then i got to hand them off to this guy to bring them the rest of the way. Mm -mm. No, 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 not at all. We're supposed to all be doing this together, all of us. And so I don't want to reinforce something that is actually negative. So whenever is possible, if I, if I ever act like I don't want to baptize someone, you guys know it's not because I don't want to baptize them. It's because I want you to or I want somebody else to understand okay good just want to make sure we're clear because we're never going to refuse to baptize someone right unless they're really not ready for it so all right so josiah tried to bring the people back but he did the best he could the reforms didn't last for very long and he made from what i can tell to be a pretty dumb mistake josiah decided to step out and block the advancement of the great egyptian army led by pharaoh Necho. Uh, the Egyptians were advancing north, and Josiah felt the need to stop them. And that felt need that he had ended up costing him his life. So he didn't end up living for a very long time. He ended up losing his life. And when he was gone, what happens to the people? Well, the good kings are gone. They start spiraling. Yeah, they start going right back downhill. So uh, as far as the chronology goes, as far as that goes, uh, I found this timeline sort of so 605 BC is the famous Battle of Carchemish I'm trying to see if I have a map here on that. I'll skip to that in a minute. that's the Battle of Carchemish then after that we have some deportations 597 then 588 down to 586 the first side the, the left side of this is kind of what we're focusing on Jeremiah is living through all these major things. In 605, the world power changed. Babylon became the world power. And then he's watching his friends be taken captive. So when the Babylonians came into Jerusalem, they did it at different intervals at different times. They didn't do it all at once. So during the first siege, they took Daniel. They took Daniel's friends, too. Who were his friends? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, or Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, the Hebrew names, right? He took uh, Daniel and his friends. So that's why they end up, and we know Daniel's book, right? They end up uh, in Babylon first. But then a little bit later on, around 597, there's another siege. They come into Jerusalem again, and they take more captives. Ezekiel would be one of those captives. So we have another prophet that's taken. And then finally, the third siege would be the biggest one. And this is where a lot of times we focus on the, uh, the end of uh, Judah because the temple was destroyed right around the year 586 B.C. And that's when a huge amount, the biggest amount of captives are all taken over to Babylon. They didn't take absolutely every person. They left a few of the poorest of the poor to just kind of take care of the land and everything. But by and large, Jerusalem is pretty much off the map. It's in ruins. And so later on when you see, um, I, I believe eventually we're going to do a series in Nehemiah you were talking about, right? So you, you'll see in that time, 
Nehemiah is weeping and is, you know, he is sad because of how awful uh, Jerusalem looks. The city's in ruins. So they are not what they used to be. So all these things happen. Um, Jeremiah, however, did something um, that just makes me wonder, man, if he, if he were alive and we were to apply this to our environment, what it would be like. And maybe you're going to experience this too. Jeremiah, after the first part of his ministry, he's telling people, repent, shape up. You're not okay because you're disobeying. You've got to clean up your act. The last part of his ministry, he's kind of realized God's made it known it's too late for these people. Babylon's coming. I'm going to use them. They're going to be punished. So Jeremiah shifts gears in his ministry from basic repentance to I guess what I would call acceptance. Accept what's coming. You've earned it. You're reaping what you sow. You're eating what you fixed. You're sleeping in the bed you made. I can't think of any other. You guys can think of some, right? You need to uh, you need to get the, you need to get this, right? You deserve this. So Jeremiah counseled them to let Babylon come. Submit to the authority of the Babylonian army because that is God's judgment because of your sins, because of what you've done. Because Jeremiah did that, he did not run into as many problems as he could have with the Babylonians. Makes sense, right? He was counseling something that they were okay with. They wanted the people to submit. However, if you are telling people to submit to an enemy, God's chosen people in his chosen city, you know, the one that he spared, and you're saying, oh, just let an enemy come in and take us over, take away the temple, how do you think the people are going to respond to that kind of message? I cannot imagine that was a pleasant experience for him. And I think it's going to show that it was not a pleasant experience to have to share that message. Which brings me to application mode today. Do we ever have to share? Well, <laughs> of course we have to share what God says, right? And there are a lot of things that God says that I particularly uh, I'm really a big fan of the whole concept of grace pretty amazing right that that Christ would be the sacrifice <coughs> for us become sin for us I can loudly and proudly proclaim that all day long and be you know be thrilled at that message and there's so many other things too you know the the power that God um, has enabled us to have through the working of his spirit um, prayer, all these other things. And then we can talk about women's role in the church. Yeah. Be honest. Do you love shouting that one out in today's society? Are you proud of it? Okay. Yeah. Tonight. Tonight we get to do it. Uh, I love it. I love sitting in this crowd hearing all the little jokes and wisecracks and stuff and then somebody comes walking through and <laughs> I know you guys, you're in the same boat I am. I know you are, right? There are just some things that I, I would suggest, culturally speaking, that is not a popular message right now. The idea of, of spheres of authority and, and a marital relationship being the man is supposed to be the head of the house and he is supposed to love his wife like he loves himself and she's supposed to submit and respect her. Saying that today is not a popular thing to say. People don't really want to hear that, but does God say it? Yeah, he does. And it never ceases. I feel like it never ceases. I could be wrong. But every so often, you bring it up in a sermon, and then there's at least one person that leaves the church. At least one. Wasn't there two or three one time? I don't remember. But inevitably, somebody will leave. Why? Because it's just not a popular message. And if it were my message that I was making up, I might just amend it so we could be popular. But it's not. It's what God says. And maybe it's crazy, but I think God knows what he's doing, even if we don't quite have it all figured out, right? What a concept, but I think it's true. And there are other things like that, too. There are things that Scripture teaches that can be harder to swallow, given you know the culture that you're in. But you got to speak the truth no matter what. I think Jeremiah is yet another example of that. Sometimes the message is not the popular one that people want to hear. And sometimes I, I would even go further to say that 
it doesn't make any sense to them. There are a lot of these people, I think their spiritual framework was so ingrained that there's, it doesn't compute to say, how could God's temple go away? How could God want his temple to be taken over by foreigners? That just makes no sense in their mind. Sure, I can see how it wouldn't make sense in their mind, but they have the prophet. And by the way, the prophet is inspired of God, right? He speaks oracles of God, the very words of God. He is their scripture, in addition to the law, which they happen to find, which is a good thing. But that is what the prophets did. Same thing in our society. We may see things that we just think, man, I'm not quite sure how that computes in every way. I'm not quite sure how, you know, God's, why God said everything that he said. But man, it's a challenge for me. Like, why do you have to answer why all the time? Why? I mean, if God said it, isn't that enough? So you've seen that bumper sticker, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Now what's wrong with that bumper sticker? The I believe it part. I don't care whether or not you believe it. You know what, in Genesis, I was reading, in the beginning, God spoke the world into existence. And then I came over and I said, hey God, I believe what you just said. And he said, oh good, thank you, Seth. And the world just existed, did you know that? Did you really, did you know that? Yeah. Good thing I believed it, right? As if our belief has anything to do with, it doesn't matter. It's what God says. It's as simple as that. And, and sometimes I think, and I'm guilty of this, so I, I would plead with you guys to grow with me in this area. <sighs> yes, try your best to understand why, because I think it helps you grow closer to God. I, think, I really think it does. But you may not always understand why, and that's no excuse for not obeying in the beginning, because God's still God. And when your parents told you to do something, you didn't always understand why, but they're still your parents. You know, they still have their role. God knows what He's doing. Whether or not we postmodern, we were talking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have to. Yeah. Oh, that's, great. that's great. All right, I guess I'll move on there. Are there any questions up to this point? Because I ramble a lot, so I don't want to cut you guys off. Unless I don't like the question. <laughs> Are there any questions of making look good? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Jay knows. Jay knows. Would this spend one the Ark of the Covenant was taken or disappeared? My understanding is yes, it's right around the time uh, when the Ark would go missing, too. Uh, people who know more may correct me on this, but there's something about that I wanted to get into a bit. So. Okay, I did put it in the notes. Uh, seven different Jeremiah's in Scripture, but this one was a priest. He was the son of Hilkiah. And why is the name Hilkiah significant? He was the one who found the book of the law. Isn't that interesting? The man that found, the high priest who found the book of the law and brought it to King Josiah, and Josiah tore his clothes, and, and they uh, did their best to bring about revival. His own son is the one who becomes the prophet who will help speak further uh, words to the people in regards to this law. So, and uh, you read about that in 2 Kings 22, verse 8. He's from the priestly town of Anathoth, which is only a few miles away from Jerusalem. So Jerusalem's the star, and Anathoth is just right there. It's really, really close by. Um, so not too far off from that. Let's see. About three miles, and it was in Benjamite territory. So... Uh, when I was looking into this, there, there were a few things about Jeremiah that were, were interesting. There's a bit of a debate as to when and where he died. Um, most people, I think, most people think that after um, his 50-year ministry, where he was in Jerusalem, in, in, um, in the region of Judah, and then at the very end, he gets forcibly dragged away to Egypt with a number of the people, and he spends some time there. A lot of people believe that he dies in Egypt, uh, and maybe he was even uh, assassinated by one of his own countrymen at that point. Um, which, man, it, when you look at the apostles and, and the prophets too, I know you guys know this, but bring it to your mind anyway, so many of them did not die the kind of death that makes you think, oh, what a great, great powerful authority, you know. 
most of them didn't, as best I can tell, most of them didn't go out with a bang. They just died and sometimes died a miserable death. And a lot of times, I, I don't think we give that thought. We think, oh yeah, these guys were sold out following God, and Paul says, follow my example as I follow Christ. Okay. How did Paul die? I don't actually remember. Does anyone remember how Paul died? I don't think it was good. Most of the apostles, when they died, he was alive. <laughs> yeah. Let's follow that example, shall we? Yeah, you know, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Yeah. Um, a lot of times we forget what that really means, I think. And Jesus told us what that means. The prophets the same way. So Jeremiah put, could have been killed by one of his own countrymen when he was dragged away to Egypt. Um, and, and we'll get into that more as to why he was there. Uh, the basic reason why, though, is Jeremiah was telling the people, submit to the yoke of Babylon, accept it, it's coming. Um, this is what God says. And a number of the people were not having it. And so instead of going to Babylon, when they saw a threat from Babylon coming, they took the opportunity to run down to Egypt and to flee there instead. And they grabbed Jeremiah and they took him there too. Jeremiah didn't want to go. He was telling him to not do that. So he was forced against his will there. And some people think he was there uh, possibly up to 20 years after 586 BC. And then he died there. But there's another view, I guess, that says that he even was alive in Egypt for about 20 years. And then Babylon came and took him and some others back, grabbed him back, and he ended up living in Babylon for a little while and then died there is another view. Um, I think it's a less popular one, but so I, I don't know the exact answer to how he died, but um, let's see. All right, I think I've covered most of that. So this map talks about a very interesting tradition. The Babylonian Empire uh, <coughs> In, in, up here in, in the region of Carchemish, that's important. In, in 605 BC, there was a huge battle. Um, my understanding is it started a little bit before that. The, so the three most powerful nations at this time would be Babylon, it would be Assyria, and it would be Egypt. Those would be the three big ones in this region, right? And for a long time, Assyria was the big powerhouse. But right around the year 607, headed towards Carchemish, there was a major political scene that, that changed things. And I, I do think it's important to talk politics to an extent, uh, because I, I do think you understand a society better. Uh, I was telling the young adult group the other day, if I were to stand outside by Courtney with a sign saying that I like the color blue, I, I might get a few strange looks, you know, people would you know, wonder, hmm, that's interesting, is there more to this? But beyond that, people might think, okay, he likes the color blue, blue is a good color. Doesn't really have changed that much. But if I were to stand out there with a sign that says, I hate Trump, would I get a little bit more attention? <laughs> I just have a feeling I would, why? Because we're somehow, we're drawn to politics in a way, aren't we? Our country is just a little bit more fixated on that than we are other things. So I think it's important to understand a little bit of the politics and um, nations and stuff of the time that we study because that's what was going on in people's minds. And what people are thinking about in their minds is going to affect how they receive a message to a certain extent too. So Assyria was the big ruthless powerhouse, but in 607 they run into Babylon and Babylon comes out victorious. So all of a sudden, Assyria is no longer the big powerful nation they once were, and they are wiped out. They are downgraded significantly. And then in 605, Egypt marches up, and they meet. And so the Battle of Carchemish in 605 is a really huge battle, and we, we find out more about that even in secular history because it changed the game as far as world powers go. Somebody, maybe it was you, Chen, that said it was, it was the real World War I. You know what I mean? It was... It, it, it changed things. So Egypt lost in that battle. And, that, and by the way, Pharaoh Necho in Egypt, when he was marching north, Josiah is the one that tried to stop him, and Josiah lost. Egypt gets up there, Babylon stomps them. Babylon emerges in this three-way battle as the new powerhouse of the world. So that's why Carchemish is significant. Now, we were talking about Jeremiah, right? Jeremiah 
uh, was preaching in Jerusalem, and he's telling people to submit to the yoke of Babylon, but he's going to get forcibly taken into Egypt when they're running away. Which, by the way, my understanding is that even though Egypt was powerful, they never really recovered from an event that happened a long time before this. Do you, do you remember the event that brought Egypt to their knees? Crossing the Red Sea. The Red Sea! <laughs> yeah, when God baptized their army a little too hard, <laughs> and they died. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, how long yeah, a little too long, we don't do that, right? When, when that happened, my understanding is Egypt, yeah, they're still a big nation, but they never seemed to recover as as a powerful enough group as they used to be. They were never the Egypt that they once were after that. Yeah? Now in Revelation, do you think that they're talking about Babylon or America's Babylon? Uh, I do not have that kind of view about Revelation in a lot of ways, but maybe you missed it. Uh, I made a rule about you only ask questions that make me look good in here. <laughs> There's a camera running, and when you raise your hand and you ask about Revelation, I'm already in a, in a dangerous area there. Uh, so I would suggest one of these two guys. Uh, However, I'm Mr. David Platt. <laughs> oh, okay. David and a couple other ones, and they talked about America will fall, gotcha. Babylon, the Great, the Harlem, the Beast, all that. So yeah, I, I, I do think trying to fit there's a the lot game. in the book of Revelation, my opinion. He knows much more. My opinion that there's a lot in the book of Revelation that I, I think is describing the battle that goes on constantly. Not necessarily focused at one event in the future. I would, if I were going to argue about one event, I'd probably be looking more towards the past because there are so many of these things that already took place. And my understanding is there are more quotes of Old Testament verses in Revelation than there are verses in Revelation, if I recall. So there is a lot uh, of Old Testament references there. So, but that's probably all I'll say on that. So, yeah. So. Among this uh, situation emerges a very interesting tradition among some of the rabbis. And this tradition speaks of the Ark of the Covenant. Some of them were saying that Jeremiah, when he flees to Egypt, before he left to flee to Egypt, well, well flee, he was taken there, he grabs, they say, he grabs the Ark of the Covenant and he takes it with him to Egypt. And he hides it. And we can't find it. It's gone. And so they they then suggest... Did you see the movie? Oh, yeah. You know exactly where it was found. You're right. Thank you. Um, so... So the tradition continued, some of them said, that as, um, as the Messianic age arises and the Messiah comes, <laughs> before that happens, at the beginning of this age, that a prophet like Jeremiah, another Jeremiah is going to come and bring the Ark of the Covenant, and he's going to open the Ark of the Covenant, and he's going to take out the pot of manna that is in the Ark of the Covenant. And he's going to break it open and feed the nations with the manna from the ark. Very interesting, okay? I'm not saying I subscribe to that. However, uh, one of the guys I was listening to that was talking about this did say something that I, find, uh, I did find interesting. There are a few places in the New Testament when um, people were making references to Jesus. And I believe one of them is in Matthew 16 where Jesus says uh, to his apostles, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they give him various responses. They say, well, some say John the Baptist. Others, Elijah. Still others, what? Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Why, why mention Jeremiah as the name of one of the prophets? Don't know. I don't want to stretch it too far. Maybe some of them still had this, this little strange belief that, oh, there's going to be a coming Jeremiah that comes, someone like Jeremiah that comes before the Messiah comes. And the whole point of that passage is they were still misunderstanding who Jesus was. Uh, of course, Peter got it right when he said, you are the Christ, son of the living God. Jesus wasn't a precursor to the Messiah. He was the Messiah. He is the Messiah. So nonetheless, I just found that interesting. And that's about all.
Does anyone know where the Ark of the Covenant is? <laughs> Can't say I've seen where it well. <laughs> it is really funny how that thing just disappeared and how there's no no trace of it, huh? Very interesting. Ah, uh, well, I find that funny. Uh, let's see. Okay, some other things about his ministry, and then oh, we're running out of time. He was told not to marry, and there's another reason why he lamented. Probably, he was told not to marry, and that was something that uh, was, as best I can tell, it's not common in Scripture. Uh, I think a lot of people, uh, when they look at Paul's writings, and, and Paul suggests, you know, that it's better not to marry when he says that. He prefaces that, though, as I recall. He says, because of the current crisis, it's my suggestion that people not get married. You, it's not wrong if you do, but he prefaces that, though. He says, because of the current crisis. And I think, you know, that makes sense. There are some situations where it's not that God's against marriage, but he counseled Jeremiah, don't do it because the lifestyle you're going to live is just not going to work very well uh, in marriage. Were there prophets that were married, though? <clears throat> There were. There were. Uh, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah was married to the prophetess. Maybe she prophesied, or maybe that was just her name because she was the wife of the prophet. You know, don't know. But yeah, some of the prophets were married. Wasn't Ezekiel married too? I thought he was. Yeah, Hosea. Hosea definitely was. Yeah. Poor guy. Now that was a different story. You're right about that. Um, and also, all right. I, I'll save the rest of this for next week. I wanted to at least get into the book before we stop today. So chapter 1, if you're looking at Jeremiah, the first chapter, let's look at that. Because right off the bat, we have a section of scripture that I think is misquoted. Uh, that's what I want to suggest to you. And then I'll leave, leave us with enough of a discussion to uh, have next week. Jeremiah chapter 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests who were in Anathoth, the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, son of, jo son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth, for to all whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them. For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put his hand and touched my mouth. And it continues there. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I have seen that phrase before on a billboard. Have any of you seen this billboard too? Mm -hmm. yes. It's got a really, really tiny little baby picture next to it or, or you know, pre-born or whatever. And then it has that phrase up there. Now, I want to be careful how I say this, because I, I'm not saying that it couldn't somewhat apply by extension, all right? But these are words that God specifically spoke about his prophet, Jeremiah. And I think that context needs to be clear. Now, does God consider uh, a child that hasn't been born yet, does he consider that child a human being? Yes, he does. There are plenty of indications in Scripture that prove that fact. Definitely. That's just one verse that I kind of think, yeah, I don't think it's the best to apply also. And, and the other reason why is because the way he said, what are, what are those words again? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before I formed you. You see what I'm saying here? So is, is non-abortion, you know what I'm saying? Can you, uh, I'm I don't like to use the term abortion because we know what it is. It's, it's murder. But there's not even in anything there yet. It's before it even happens. I knew you. You know what I mean? We're not even talking about that, that yet. God is looking way, way in advance. So here's what I want to talk about next week, and we'll leave it at this. Did Jeremiah have a choice in the matter? Don't answer that now. <laughs> Did he have a choice? Sorry I kept you long. Let's pray. Father... Thank you so much for, 
for the dedication of your prophets and the one in particular that we get to look at together, I pray that you would help us to be like him in his faithfulness to you. And it's in your son's name I pray. Thank you.